What do you got there? Cigars, would you like one? No, cigar, no a cigar is a cigarette without any manners. <laughs> An Englishman said that. It, Churchill? No, I don't know which one. I just assume it must have been. Of course it's an Englishman. Because it's witty and it's, it's an erudite and exactly. swift. Exactly. What do you think an American would come up with that? You'd, no. You'd be you, bludgeoned with it by you, an American. I believe the English race was created just to give us American something to quote from. <laughs> That's our whole function is to give exactly. you a, sort of a, a backstory. Yes, you're a, a lexicon with a, with a nice green... <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, so you're cutting a cigar. Yeah. Now you can also use that for circumcision, you know. I, I ha actually botched one before I came in. I thought I'd trim the foreskin out of respect for your country. I know it's <laughs> preferred here. Not that I imagined that our fallacies would necessarily be involved in the conversation, but I gave it a trim and it's not been a complete success. I'll level with you. Is that the correct plural of phallus? Falli, you reckon? Well, I mean, when you say fallacies, it sounds like fallacies, the word. So, like, fallacies. are you saying it, that your penis is a fraud? <laughs> yeah, and a, 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 yeah I guess you'd be saying that our penises are a fraud. It's certainly taken me in some peculiar directions. I bet you your penis has seen some things. Yeah. I mean, what? You're, why are you wincing? It's something to be proud of. That you, you are, You're one of the few, like, rock star comedians. Did you, you see me that way? I still see you. Look how you're dressed. Look how you look. You played a rock star twice in movies, I think, right? Greek. That's right. And you married a rock star and you just, and you were on heroin. I mean, you were a rock star, <laughs> you know, and you have the look. You have the look. When it, you say it like you that. You can't buy that. It sounds fantastic. If you could buy it, I would have done it by now. The thing is, uh, Bill, is that whilst that sounds like a tremendous set of experiences, I was, of course, there while they were happening. <laughs> <laughs> they were mostly rather bleak, <laughs> in all honesty. I find that hard to believe. I, people say that all the time when they describe this life that the rest of us could only dream of, <laughs> you know, with the women, the drugs, and the guns and adulation, the partying, and I'm like, why can't you people just enjoy this? I feel I certainly would. Possibly there's a difference between Epicureanism, oh. hedonism, and what I think I have, which is addiction. And I suppose addiction means that you're trying to remedy a spiritual or possibly from a secular perspective, psychic condition through sort of external means. And rather than, oh, I'm a joyous, piratical sort of sex buccaneer. For me, I was just on like a kind of, <laughs> I'm unhappy. And also I'm, I'm like a- By the way, sex buccaneer is, is the greatest name for a band. Yeah. If you ever start one. And if you ever wanted to make a portmanteau out of those, fuckaneer seems so fuckaneer. available. Right, portmanteau, another great word. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm sorry you didn't have a better time having a better time <laughs> yeah. than the rest of us. Look, actually, I'm not seeking uh, any, any sympathy from it. I'm just sort of remarking, Bill, that like when I hear my life described, I think, oh my God, that sounds so cool and indeed was everything I aspired to as a young man trying, I think, to somehow mitigate feelings of unease and emptiness, probably in common with many comics and entertainers. And when I did it, it just did not work and has left me one of the few areas where I imagine we are somewhat at odds, uh, only with a kind of spirituality as my well, last re remaining why do we um, have to, option. Why do we have to drag all this depressing psychological stuff into it when it just would be great to get a lot of drugs and pussy. I don't understand why we have to overthink it and complicate it. And it's just like when is that I was- really your position? It is, <laughs> and I will stand by it. I'm a one issue candidate on drugs, <laughs> and, drugs and pussy and not overthinking it. I mean, not, not pussy, but like, you know, Yes, I mean, just rock star sex. I mean, is there a man uh, alive who doesn't, um, you know, at some point in his youth aspire to that? There certainly wasn't when I was 13 years old. What would you be if you could have anything? A rock star. Uh, the girls throw themselves at you, right? Just that, just that, just girls throw themselves at you. Y you had me. <laughs> Absolutely, and certainly it's what I aspire to, but it, even in your description of it, it was an adolescent fantasy. And the problem with adolescent fantasy is, is that 
you grow up, I grew up, and I found myself inhabiting something that didn't endure for me. But, um, you well, describe me as an idealist, and I am an idealist, and I feel like, well, what is that? I, I, idealism, I suppose, is the, the suggests that there's a, a telos, that there's an a, a object that I'm moving towards. And for me, that's a sort of a, I don't know, is it self-actualization? Is it redemption? Is it love? Is it to live a worthwhile life? I mean, what are all of the principles that we're discussing when we're having a conversation around polit politics? What's undergirding it if we don't have any ideals. I mean, if it is just the sort of sort of brutal pragmatism of who gets what, you know, I mean, I know those sort of highly consequential com conversations, but surely whether or not you believe in God or if you believe in America or whatever values you hold, we're, we're sort of saying there's something we're aspiring to, there's some meaning. So to, so to, to just wrap up what I feel about the hedonism is, I now, now know that what I sought out was the fantasy of a boy and it doesn't work. It didn't work. Not to say that they were. It didn't work for pleasure. you. It worked splendidly for Rod Stewart. So, mm -hmm. so you know, <laughs> yeah, let's not let's not lump. We we're all different people. And and from you know, again, I'm sort of being facetious about this. But the idea that because you went to this different model of marriage and children, whatever that is that people mm. do, that means you <laughs> grew up and I didn't. I must reject that because again, I think you're projecting. I, I, it's not that I haven't grown up. Of course I've grown up and I'm just as mature as some other immature people in lots of ways. But no, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm immature because I never wanted to go into that model, which I have seen fail so much more than I have seen it work. And, and so like, do I feel the need to like spawn to, to be labeled a grown up? I don't. I'm not suggesting that the only route to maturation is to have a family or to procreate or even enter into sort of social norms around matrimony. I'm, I'm not suggesting that at all. The, the distinction I'm making is that for me, when I lived hedonistically, it didn't work. And I, I recognize right. that is different. I reckon I'm talking particularly as, a, as, a, as an addict. But can actually. I ask you in percentage wise, like what percentage didn't work? Certainly there must have been a little percentage that was fun. And then there was like like a hangover. It's like if you ask me after I've had too much to drink when I have a hangover, would you trade? No, I would. I would love to trade. Yes, I would love to go back to last night and not be drinking. I would give that fun up because this is just too painful. But I didn't see it coming that bad. Is it like that? Or where there was there was no joy in Mudville? There was no joy uh, before the pain. They, a common trope around addiction is it was fun, then it was fun with consequences, then it was consequences. And, no? for, and uh, for me, it was quite concentrated. Even now, as I've, I was 20 years, I'm 20 years clean from substance misuse really? now, drink and drugs. And still now I can feel in me the uh, palette of emotions and yearning that leads to overuse, for example, of substances. It was so clear mm. that what it was in me was a sort of a psychic or spiritual yearning, a sense that this is not enough, the world. You know, and I'm talking now about the world I inhabited as a boy, right. as a child. Like, this isn't going to fulfill me. I need something else. I need, what is it, values? Is it community? Is it connection? Is it meaning, purpose? What is it? And, you know, and I feel denied that. The one of the things that concerns me, I suppose, about the secular framing of the ideological sphere is that once you extract a sort of a shared purpose that for me has to have a, a, a sort of a, a, if not a sprinkling of the divine, it's, it's, it's actually a, a divine crucible. Unless they're like, what is pleasure alluding to? That's what I'm saying, I suppose. Like when I'm like sort of, if you're in love with someone or if you're making love with someone or if you're high, what is it that you're touching? What is this ulterior what? thing? So. I mean, who said art for art self? Was it Oscar Wilde? What, why? I mean, isn't that the same thing as pleasure for pleasure self? Why does it have to allude to anything? It is the end. Sometimes the journey is over. Some people, I think, just like to stay on the road. I like to be home. And home is like, if you, you know, are not every day is happy, of course, but a day when you're like feeling good, you have things to look forward to, you feel like you're doing something useful, 
and uh, you also have pleasure in your life, excitement with other people and conversation, sex. I, I, I don't, I, I don't like, I don't want to go further. Like okay, yeah. that, that's a, like as long as I'm on Earth now. Maybe we don't know. Maybe in the next world, if there is one, um, there is some other dimension. But on this Earth, I'm not going to get to that dimension. Or, or you say you can through meditation and and just that kind of stuff. I think some people kind of cannot live without that dimension. I wonder, even taking something as um, broad yet particular as the opioid crisis in your country well, that it can't we can't allow it to be lost on us that there's a significant f- proportion of the, the population that are in so much pain that they need yes. to obliviate it somehow what is the source of this pain now when you say pleasure you know it needn't lead anywhere we're, from an evolutionary perspective we are aware that it is entirely perfunctory we're aware that eating food feels good in order to uh, mandate that behavior that sex feels good in order to encourage that behavior so there is at least facility in him i wonder sometimes i ponder the unanswerable i wonder what is the function of pleasure and as someone that has i suppose right. gotten myself into i want to say it's not worked for me very well you know and, and that is a distinct we're obviously dif- different men and like I, well, I one of the things i've been blessed with is i'm pretty non-judgmental actually about the way other people live i don't so it's not like i don't care but right. i recognize i don't know no, very you're much. just passionate about what you believe yeah and and we are different in the sense that you said it like you ponder the unponderable i go well, that's not ponderable. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to ponder it. Can't Why am that. I wasting my time Try pondering when I could be partying? <laughs> this you is know? wasteful pondering. Um, no, I feel like, you know, was it Freud who said, you know, it's based, there's work and love. Those are the two things that we have. And I, I, I don't go much beyond that. Like that spiritual dimension, I don't, den- you know, I'm. Uh, you mentioned Larry Charles before and religious and religious is a, not a mean-spirited movie at all. That's why I think it did pretty good because people didn't see it as an attack on religion. They just said, you know, here's, here's the reality of this and we're not hating on anybody. But it says, it, the, the message of the movie is, I, I say, I'm, I'm from the church of, I don't know. I'm not definitive about there is not a God. Who the fuck knows? I can't answer the questions that are unanswerable the difference to me with a, between a religious person and a non-religious person is we both admit there's these questions. I don't make up stories to answer them because I know there are stories that are made up. So like, can I tell you how the universe began? I cannot, and neither can you. So when you give me your story, I'm just saying, I, did, it, I know people with a faith think that that makes them sound some sort of so sublime. And all I'm thinking is, well, plainly you heard this story and now you're repeating it. And that's really all there is to it. And those things that are beyond us to know while we're on earth, I just feel like, why why masochistically torture yourself trying to figure something that you can't in this life? It's like, I I picture somebody who's, there's there's a wall they're standing in front of and they feel like, if I could just get a little higher, I could get there and look over the wall when they don't realize the wall is a million miles high. Mm. They're not even close to doing that. And yet they're thinking, if I could just, see a little more you can't Mm. so you know i think that makes it easy to be not a troubled soul yeah because i don't have one that's pretty great (laughs) i mean i really admire that and i I certainly agree but when we contrast what is known with what is unknown it, we have to accept that we are dealing with a negligible amount of data, even with the wonders of cosmology and the quantum world, the little that we understand amounts to zero. I suppose my, you need to like something. Have, can I have that circumcision thing? Yeah, absolutely. I for, thought you'd never ask. Well, <laughs> do you mean for your penis? <laughs> <laughs> no, for, for my cigar. Let me, let me. It, they, they always put a big, fucking thing on the end of it are these clove cigarettes is that what that is as a clove exactly cigarette? so simple I, I clove cigarette you, a simple man enjoying a clove cigarette and i say it every week clubhouse i do not know what they're putting in these clubs but because is it is it having a positive effect it's so fantastic yeah it's been 20 years for you huh mate yeah 20 years and you never uh you never one just one day out of the blue you never just go 
boy, it would be good to just smoke one joint and be hot. You know, just, just pot. I mean, you know, that's a pretty benign... You must have had some good times on pot before it all went sour. Well, I do actually remember feeling quite... I don't know where I put my suit. I'd like Mary Poppins, eh? Rooting around in my little carpet bag. Um, <laughs> yeah. For my you circumcision device. You didn't leave it on your dick, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I, lost my, I lost my nerve halfway through. Um, like... But you are circumcised, right? No, actually not. No? Like a lot of English people, we... Really? They, they, I'm very unwilling to give so up any, any part of that <laughs> aspect. I'm clinging on to every millimeter. But it's so gross. I always said it looks like something that lives in the ocean. <laughs> so, so you didn't... We, Don't you enjoy... Well, the thing is you're denying yourself variety because when you retain the foreskin, there's times where it entirely retracts and retreats. There's other times where it pops out to say hello. You see like a glimpse of it. Really? <laughs> yeah, it, it gives you... It's a surprise. Every time I look at my underpants, it's okay. I, you I don't know who I'm going to meet. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about this. It's yeah, just no, messing with your... It's, like, it's you've that, asked for it and I'm, I like to help people. Yeah, I mean, we just... Have, I love the it's, opportunity it's okay. to help. I live to help. It's, it's, it's hysterical. Sorry about this. The, no, no, I think it's a, a delightful version of this show. <laughs> Not that this is really a show, but it's on a very special episode. Russell Brand searches endlessly. It's sort of a metaphor for what we were talking about. Right. You, you're a searcher. I'm a seeker. I won't you, stop seeking. You, exactly. Isn't that interesting the way that happened? Do you think that's some kind of cosmic? Yeah. You do? I do. I think that continually we're hey, being granted. What kind of show do you think? <laughs> what kind of you seem so confident, Bill. <laughs> what kind of show do you think this is? All of the Epicureanism. Oh. This guy lives for pleasure. <laughs> oh, fuck it. I'm in. <laughs> well... I've never had a guy blow me, but if I had to have one, I'd, I'd pick you. That's a really very lovely compliment, and I'm going to be watching out for your media appearances to see if you make good on this pledge that you'll, that you'll forget and move on. How often do you come to, to come to America? Or if I was in a bar, do you come to America often? Oh, infrequently. Um, no, not frequently? Not, not, not these days. I've not been for a while because I don't know if you on noticed purpose? there was a... There was a a pandemic you quite know, recently oh, right. slowed people down. It but you still travel. like us, don't you? I love America. I've got a green card, as a matter of fact. So, oh, really? Does that mean I am American? I wish I like. Do you know, it's bothered no, me. No, no, I love that it thing. that you. Uh, you know what? I always say oh, yes, when you're a sports it. fan. Hey, I found it. You found it. <laughs> the mu is it mule? Oh. I don't. Know. What's the uh, moil? Moil. That's the name of the people that do circumcision yes. in the yes. Judaic faith. And you know something? Want to hear something gross? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I came, Bill. I'm surprised I've heard anything else. <laughs> okay, so sometimes the moil gives the baby herpes. Oh, that's not right, is it? But, <laughs> that can't well, be. Well, is that part of the ceremony? It's not, no, they should do that. It's definitely not right. But because, like, this has happened many times, like, because they have herpes and then they bite. There's a part of it where they bite. bite the penis or, or something where the penis goes in the mouth. And, you know, I'm all for uh, people doing whatever they want. I mean, again, when I preached against religion, it's I've, I was certainly was never saying, well, you shouldn't be able to. No, of course, you could think any crazy shit you want. But when it bleeds into bleeding yeah. <laughs> and and child abuse, you know, you I mean, I would even say it's child abuse that. Uh, when they seek the the Buddhists, you know, supposedly the we're not religious, we're we're better than you actual religious people, we're more spiritual. <laughs> okay. And yet when the when the Lama dies, they snatch a child who they have divined to be the reincarnation of the recently dead Lama. And I've seen a documentary on this. And the mother is weeping. Of course, because they're taking her two-year-old away. And the child is weeping because he's being separated from his mother. And he has to go to some, you know, monastery where they, because he's the reincarnated Lama, and we're going to examine his poop or whatever they do to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, On what amounts to, let's face it, a hunch. <laughs> of a hunch. <laughs> that, 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 this is a Dalai Lama. A, a hunch at best. <laughs> you, first of all, I mean, you have to believe in reincarnation. Now, maybe you do. Do you? Well, I mean, what I feel like is that it, once we start to frame 
the unknowable within the ordinary using quotidian language to right. describe the right. ephemeral. Wow. We're in danger of saying stuff that's kind of stupid. And yet we need ceremony and yet we need ritual. I just say would say that if the ritual does involve biting off a baby's dick <laughs> or snatching a child from its mother, you should be absolutely sure there's no other motive. <laughs> you want to be sure about that. Yes, because, well, I mean, well said, because religion certainly is known as the biggest pussy scam ever. I mean, everybody's got one. Cops will pull over a pretty girl and, you know, that's a big thing with cops and girl. I don't know any pretty girl who doesn't have a story about a cop who tried to fuck them, pull the, hey, you need a ride, or you know, you need an escort, whatever their, their shit is. Everybody's got a scam. And, but boy, religion, their scam is, a lot of it is, uh, I'm the prophet and God told me to fuck all the chicks in the compound. Yeah, does it, so like, yeah and also they're not- And the Catholics some, with the little boys. That's right, they're not particular about the genitalia. Like they're sort of equal opportunities. Uh, you're right about that. Uh, many a good cult has oh, been ruined. I'm going to cut off my finger. Do, do, yeah. I, I don't, do you hold? Do you hold it there? Do you want me to help with this? Because I don't want to look Show me over. how you uh, <laughs> how operate this thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are we taking because off? We're look, taking off the okay, top end of oh, that. Yes. Like that. It's like a guillotine. Right. Vive la France. Like that. Bloody aristocracy holding us back. <laughs> Robespierre, that crew, oh. just like that. And what is this thing called? This. This I don't know. I guess isn't it still going to be called a cigar car? Pro, uh, like you know, in your country, probably a cigar a, car. In mine, like, how about a mini moil? A mini moil. <laughs> you <laughs> know, like, if I do. Or a, <laughs> or a he's not included. Or a portable moil. Yeah, you know? portable moil. I mean, it's a a mini moil. Yeah, I, I like that. <laughs> let's go auto into, moil, let's, mini moil. Let's go into business. We brainstormed a few <laughs> names. We've got we've gone with mini moil. Let's go. In, I'm going to use this. It's called a scissors. I don't know well, why. You've got I all was, of that stuff. You've got a lot of I, uh, you know paraphernalia. What? I always Bill. say, if you live long enough, you do everything. And now I can say I used a mini moil, mm -hmm. and I have no desire to use it again. I'll stick with the scissors. Someone asked me recently if I wasn't a comedian, political talk show host, or a podcaster, what business would I start? I don't know, maybe open an animal rescue shelter or a dog-friendly strip club or are weed trucks legal yet? Whether you're starting a new business or growing one, if you want it to be successful, you need the most talented people on your team. That's where ZipRecruiter comes in. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash random. ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology finds highly qualified candidates for a wide range of roles. If you see someone you like who'd be perfect for your job, ZipRecruiter lets you send them a personal invite so they're more likely to apply. And they use all kinds of key words to entice the right candidates. You've heard of quiet quitting? This is more like loud hiring. Let ZipRecruiter fill all your roles with the right candidates. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to the exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash random. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash random. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Did you know HBO Max had podcasts? Now go even deeper inside your favorite shows with audio companions to some of the most groundbreaking and award-winning shows on television. Succession is an original series from HBO and it's back for a fourth season. Every week you can join journalist and host Kara Swisher as she unpacks real-world events that echo the saga unfolding on screen. Guests include top journalists, writers, psychologists, as well as some of the people involved in making the TV show. Stream Succession on HBO Max and check out HBO Succession podcast on HBO Max and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, you were talking about reincarnation. You were talking about oh, yeah. a, 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 a lot of the sort of more Rococo aspects <laughs> of I Buddhism. Love that word. <laughs> Rococo, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, yeah, because it is Love quite it. austere and stringent and we're not saying that there's a God necessarily and all of this stuff, but we are yeah, following a, 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 a flume of smoke, a plume of smoke <laughs> to <laughs> divine whether or not this child was a, a llama. And I wouldn't disparage a, a, anybody's uh, religion. It's, it's, it does, it's unbecoming. No. But uh, I, I, 
I suppose, yeah. I suppose what my spiritual beliefs amount to is a kind of benign intent towards one another and the potential for an ulterior realm, i.e. that all apparent separateness emerged at some point from unity. And that is underwritten by the most rudimentary explanation of the Big Bang. All of the matter and phenomena was held within a you know, subatomic. What, what do you think about the Big Bang? As Terence McKenna says, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. You know, like what precedes this? I mean, it's glorious and obviously demonstrable for, as a result I mean, of the movement of matter, but it doesn't solve a lot. Of, it doesn't solve the problem of the Tuesday before the Big Bang is, of course. But I mean, also, and I look, people who I really think are way smarter than me, I know they are about this subject, which I am very limited in astrophysics. Okay, that's just not my area. Let's get into this, I know the I know the basics, but just the real basics. But, you know, I, I, I fully believe Neil deGrasse Tyson knows this stuff on a level that I cannot understand. So I really, uh, my point is, as someone who's not religious, I'm also just taking this on faith. Because when you go into what the Big Bang is, mm. that everything in the universe fit into something yeah. that as, as that could fit into your mini moil. That's right. We could snip that. Maybe that's right. what caused it. And let's go into how what what is fitting into something the size of a quarter. Okay. Imagine the earth being so compacted that it could fit into a quarter. Now, if I just said the whole earth could fit in, you'd be like, that is so ridiculous. Okay, now let's add all the other planets and our sun and say they could fit in there. Oh, wow, now you're really stretching it. Okay, but it's not just our planets <laughs> and our sun, it's all the planets and all the suns. So we're talking about trillions of stars, maybe trillions of galaxies, certainly hundreds of billions of galaxies all fitting in something that small. Now that does sound as ridiculous as God said to his mm. child, son, <laughs> I'm going to uh, go send you down to earth and I've knocked up this Palestinian woman. She's going to have you and then you're going to die and come back to life. Now I don't believe that happened. But the other one about the Big Bang is almost as silly unless you're an astrophysicist. Similarly, they require a curtailing of inquiry. At some point, you have to stop investigating or you go, well, that doesn't make sense. What all reality? What is the nature of consciousness? How does consciousness emerge from biochemical processes? Right. Why is Newtonian physics fallen apart in the quantum realm? Everything that we understood to be right. real. Why is matter mostly space? And what I'm saying is that in the end, through brinkmanship, you find yourself at the point of miracle. And the reason that I, I embraced spirituality is because it suggests a sense of ethics. Not that I know many great right. atheists, and right. uh, you know, both comics like Ricky Gervais and yes. Brian Cox and like, you know, in my, my country and stuff. Um, and I, we, we mostly agree, be moral, love one another, right. be of service, all of those things. And that, that, so why focus on the, the points of distinction, really, when you agree on what appear to be the most fundamental aspects of it? But, but for me, uh, the idea that what we are honouring is non-separateness, the glory of diversity and individuality, the kind of the sort of ever-expanding fractal nature of our reality, all of this wonder, all of this awe, and somehow... Is, is, is it relevant to the way we organize our systems of, of power or not? What are we going to do? Because once you extract the possibility of unity, once you extract the possibility that love has some value, some resonance, and, impacts is, and is perhaps, in fact, the felt experience of oneness, are you pouring that about knowing what it is? I, 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 I want to get... <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Continue. I'm listening to what you're saying. I want to hear it. <laughs> Is that urine? No, no. <laughs> Tell me, finish this thought. It's just, yes, I forgot that this was the uh, soda. I suppose. Well, all right, then, as long as you stopped, I'd like to make this point about, I feel like when religion is ethical, it's coincidental. I'm not saying it's not, religion can't be, but it stumbles upon it like almost um, haphazardly. The Bible, I mean, the Ten Commandments, most of them have nothing to do with what we would call ethics or morality. The top four are just about God being jealous. Actually, uh, well, here I would differ. I've really? I've got an interesting perspective once on the That's Ten Commandments. If, if you consider them instead of edicts, 
you know, and I know that the name commandment suggests this. <laughs> I've just commanded that you do that. But if you ignore that, and like, what, how I like to look at it is, uh, if you consider when you are enlightened, you will not steal, you will not kill. And as for the point of uh, worship no other gods than me, all of us engage in idolatry. What I believe the point that is being made is, if you do not find God, if you do not find your own God, which could be love, which could be America, which could be nature, which could be abundant and limitless things, if you do not find that, then everything is potentially God. Your lust suddenly is God. Your desire for entertainment is your God. Greed is your God. You shall worship no other gods than me. And this God is, uh, so, mm. See, supp submission for me, Bill, is not just about supplication so that I mean, you, you can be organised into a lovely little yeah. flock. It's about if you. It's the first system that you need to conquer is the self. The self. The, if I okay, can't I, overcome my ego, then I, I will live. That is my god. I, That's I, how I take I, it. I, I get that. I, you're Do right. You, Bill. I, <laughs> Do you? <laughs> what, this is quite what, complicated. What's that? Your new American <laughs> character? No, this is thing? my new American you're, you're, character. But uh, you're being very charitable to the author of the Ten Commandments, who lived in the Bronze Age and did not have your flowery interpretation. It's nice that you can uh, put that on it. I mean, yes, that's that's a lovely way to interpret it. It's not what he meant. What oh. he meant is there's a man in the sky. <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it, for us to discern what as it tra as it went through Aramaic to Greek to King James version. They just version. didn't think like that back then. They were they they didn't know what germs or atoms were. I'm, they were scared. They believed in gods in a very real. W I've studied the Bible. I took a course on it at Cornell. The Bible that the, they they definitely were not making them. This were not metaphorical. It was not. The, uh, I That's think okay. that you will. I think that if you look at that book as literal, then I feel that its value is limited. And I think most articles of faith bear the inflection of the culture f that they were produced by, it necessarily and understandably. But what I would say about my obviously limited understanding of hermeneutics is that people appear in the in the desert faiths to be aspiring to some kind of unity. Now, I know there's some stuff in there that's very like, that's somewhat at odds with our, uh, our modern take on reality, but I also would pull you up on, you know, this is only a couple of thousand years ago. 10,000 years ago, we were basically the same pre-agriculturally. For hundreds yes. of thousands of years, we lived in l little tribal societies yes. organized around manageable relationships. Our nearest ancestors, the pri I mean, like uh, the, the primates, when they hit communities of 70, 80, they split. And I feel there's so much to be learned from the values that preceded civilization as we understood it, particularly in a time like this of fracture and nihilism. So I'm not dismissive of any of that documentation, not least because these, how do these myths survive? Who do they serve? Now you can make somewhat cynical yeah. arguments about like Protestantism no, succeeded in Northern Europe because it deified w the work ethic. So it was like a, a good way of getting people into the grind, useful for agriculture, useful even when the industrial revolution it was. took place. But but just because of, the, 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 of utility, I don't feel that we can be dismissive of it. And also, Bill, the, the challenge that's left for me is once we exclude the spiritual path, we are left with post-enlightenment rationalism. And what that seems to lead to is the reverence for the individual celebration only of the, the primal urges and the primal right. desires I mean, and, yeah. and, and that which can be right. measured. And, and, right, and believing excessively in spirituality and things of a beyond the realm of earth mode <laughs> leads to flying planes into buildings and lots of other horrible things. But so don't you think there's a counter argument to all of that, that really those things well, are about dominion and, ter and yes, territory saying, and they're not... You know, once, you, once you let the balloon off the ground, once you take all, off those blocks and, and let your mind just go completely free up in the air with nothing to tether it, then it's very easy to go from, I love my God, to, you know, you have a different God, I really should kill you. 
But, but is this not how... true in the post-Westphalian treaty age of nation? I love my nation, so therefore I don't like your nation. I mean, it, it, what is the distinction between a religious ideology and nationalistic well, ideology when, when it comes to the boots on the ground and the drones in the sky? You know, we're killing you rationally at a distance. Sorry about that wedding we bombed. If you know, you, and this and then You are going to bring in the Treaty of Westphalia. <laughs> which the I Treaty of Westphalia was, is on the table, Bill. I believe it was 16. 48. I believe it was that, that and I believe it, 12 minutes before five. I believe it followed the defenestration of Prague, where they threw him out the window, where we get the word defenestration. Well, out the window. Out you go. And it's, it's, that word has now come back into vogue, not oh. just because Putin does it literally, but it's a word that people use when they're talking about someone being canceled. He was defenestrated, he, defenestrated, which is great because it's from French, the fenêtre of window. Mm. So to to throw it's someone a out of it, it's a yeah. But I want to know who is this guy, Herman Nudix? <laughs> no, I, no, that's I, old school, man. But I don't know that word. Herman Nudix means a, a literary set of uh, books around a particular faith. The hermeneutics, this, the canon, the canon of a particular religious set of like ideals. Like the Quran plus the. Uh, there's the, they, the Islamic what? hermeneutics, Christian hermeneutics, right. the set of documents that underwrite a particular faith. Have you studied these like like in their original? I mean, you seem so no. learned on this. You must read a lot. No, well, I, I try. Yeah, I try to read, but this is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's what a third grader says. Of course, sure. you try. No, but but all of the squiggles. Like how many? Page. How much do you say? Would you read a day? And do you read books like actual books? Because that's gone out of style. Um, but I'm going to stick up for books. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I do. And I sort of have a, I suppose what I have, like most autodidacts, is sort of shallow knowledge in a variety of areas. I've not been educated. So I. A cocktail party knowledge, would you say? That's what I've got, except that's for. that's what I feel like I have. Except for when I've had to legitimize my solipsism. There I have studied. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, so when it comes to why am uh, I like this? Why do I feel this way? Right. What have other people exactly. felt like? Don't, and don't you think that politics is an extension usually just of a personality we're born with? I feel like yeah. being, I mean, you were arguing with John on the show and like, it's so funny that people, they have a lot of trouble like, um, you know, following your politics because it doesn't follow the neatly cleaved divisions that we're in. Yeah, like you'll you'll go after MSNBC, uh, and it's it's not because you're a fan of Fox News. No, no. I mean, it's it's kind of like to the left of that. So, or it's not in anywhere that you could say, oh, that's left or right. It's just how you see it. I feel like I do this exact same thing and people, they don't like it when someone doesn't have a team or a lot of people don't. The people who do like it, they like us a lot, but a lot of people just can't get there because we don't have a team and you can't predict what our take on something is going to be. That's right. And that is, you know, I know it sounds like we're clapping ourselves on the back, but I mean, it's also just true. That is so lacking. I think it's the, been great what you've done, having the chats with the people on the conventional right. If we're not going to have these conversations, what the hell's going to happen? These people are not self-deporting. It's half the country. You have to talk. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, the, when you look at the internet and all that kind of shit, it's always this, uh, we own them or we're going to own them. Or like somebody said, did something that they don't, is not, uh, stupid or not up to par. Oh, they got owned. They got destroyed. It's like all this language that keys people up to think that they can, that, that the answer to the the thing when you don't agree with somebody and I you know there's all these people I don't agree with of course is to destroy them yes uh, especially when you know I'm 67 years old like their big thing is with if they don't like something I say it's just they, they don't attack the argument itself it's just you're old as if that's an argument it's like yeah exactly that's why I know some shit and you're making a dumb argument <laughs> or not even finding an argument I will say even on this point that when we're talking about anthropology and how societies might organize, how families and tribes might organize, the annihilation of the category of the elder is 
in mm. error. When you're chatting to exactly. Bernie Sanders on the show, I'm thinking these yes. guys, they've been around longer than me. They know stuff I don't know. I, 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 I've asked an array of things and now maybe I will learn something if I shut up for a minute. Perhaps you noticed that I talked a little less in that moment. And like, I'm, what? And I, I have a regard and reverence for that. And we're both uh, as part of a, um, because of my personal practice of how, how, how I might learn more and how I ought treat people, but also because in other areas where it, it might be easier to enter into conflagration and conflict, I feel that it's vital. Like I saw the other day after the release of the Capitol Hill, Jan 6 stuff to Fox News and in particular Tucker Carlson in a, a British newspaper, The Guardian, like it, it said, like I'm just, I'm just reading it. I can't imagine what led me to do it. And I, I regret that I did. Uh, and it sort of said like, um, you know, he, he, they released documents, uh, you know, Kevin McCarthy to the far right TV presenter, Tucker <laughs> far right. I mean, I got it, like, you know, it used to be like even in your like, country, like that, you know, you'd have people in your family that are Republican and libertarian and people that are lefties and whatever, right. and we'd all just crack on and chat at exactly. Thanksgiving. Not like, like far right. I think if far right, that means that that's a haircut, that's boots. Right. You know, you can't like just be far right because you're a traditional conservative well, person. Did, I don't know if you saw this, but when the Italian prime minister Maloney was elected, uh -huh. Okay, so we never really got to it on our show. I wanted to, I guess we ran out of time, but like the the papers were like, they were apoplectic. Fascism has come back to, yeah, and they uh, could not stand this. And like, my position was, I don't follow Italian politics that much. I've read some of her statements. It doesn't sound like fascism to me. It sounds like things that we've heard people in this country on the right, you know, it's a lot about we need to like, not forget our roots and traditional stuff like family. And, you know, I understand why there's a backlash to some of the shit that's going on. It, it wasn't particularly, it, I'm a, it was like, I'm a mother and I'm proud to be a mother. Okay, yeah. it's, not a, it's not fighting words. <laughs> so, and also I wanted to make the point because they kept saying, well, she, her party has fascist roots. So did the Democrats. They were the party of slavery, okay? And Jim Crow, the Democrat, then they outgrew it. So to like to put that on her, that you know the, the roots yes all our parties have roots we we all grow from from corrupt places and now she's i see she's invited to the white house and again i don't know who, i don't know who this broad is i'm not defending her i'm just saying the 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 immediate like hair trigger oh my god the world has ended italy has elected a fascist it's just the kind of thing that makes me go i don't trust you in the media i just don't trust you mm. there's some mm. truth in that but it's your narrative I think they call it uh, something like, uh, I don't know, some kind of journalism now where it's like advocacy journalism, where it's like, we're not even trying, we're not even proposing that we're neutral on this and just going to tell you what mm -hmm. happened and give you the facts. We're going to inject our advocacy into the front page where we used to reserve it for the opinion page. Bill, I feel that the terrifying truth might be that the liberal establishment has been co-opted by the very interest that in the Bush-Cheney era we understood to be Republican. It's been co-opted by military industrial complex interests. It's been co-opted by pharmaceutical interests. It's been co-opted by financial interests. And they are simply unable to have the conversation about why there is not a political party that represents the interests of ordinary Americans. That when Bernie Sanders was saying on your show that it's you know, like who, who is the affiliate party of ordinary working Americans now, like more people say the problems. A comparable thing has happened in our country. It seems that there's been a sort of a pro professionalization, if I dare offer such a term, of both the media class and punditry and politics more generally. And there's a kind of distaste for working people. I was trying to get out with the Brexit argument. They don't like ordinary people. And the only way to mask that is, I think, by s rightly honoring important issues around identity and excluded gr cultural groups. Those are conversations that need to be had. And I think they know that those conversations need to be had, but I think they're only willing to have those conversations because they recognize that you cannot bring to the table anymore an agenda that will affect the interests of the powerful. Like he said, like Bernie said, they were bought out by the same financial interests that we'd conventionally associate no, with them. And we're seeing it in the advocacy for war, that you can't talk about peace, you can't talk about diplomacy, that you have to vilify and reduce every narrative that Zelensky's a hero and Putin's a monster. He's like, well, this is, uh, that's not the world that I live in. Thank well, you. wait a second. Zelensky is a hero and Putin is a monster. 
Well, the Panama Papers <laughs> suggested that Z Zelensky, like a lot of Ukrainian politicians, has some interesting uh, business dealings. Well, and, or, uh, and that he rejected the okay. Minsk agreement. And there was a peace deal on the table, and the West t t lobbied Zelensky not to take that peace deal. So said the well, former well, uh, Israeli yeah, because, prime minister. Because his country got invaded illegally. I mean, you know, I, I, I can't, I don't know why you're... Well, I would say, Bill, because of the uh, ever since the fall of the Berlin Wall, there's been encroachment on former Soviet territory. That there was a NATO-inspired coup in 2014, and that there are significant profits being made. It's the same, in a sense. Look, I would offer this. I'd feel a lot more comfortable Wait, who's about coup in 2014. The the 2014 coup in Ukraine that was Crimea. backed by U.S. interests. Why would we back a coup that gave Crimea to Putin? They the, lost Crimea in 2014, Ukraine. The ongoing, I think, right? Bill, to to say that this is that this is a humanitarian war that has, as an inadvertent side effect, created all this opportunity for profit in, for the military industrial complex is as naive as suggesting that the pharmaceutical industry would keep good on their pledge to not profit from the pandemic. I'm not entering into the territory. Yeah. Like geopolitics is bloody complicated. Putin is a, clearly a former KGB, hardcore dictator style yes. politician. But like, I, I think that when we extract American, you, the American unipolar agenda, the idea that there can be a global hegemony, that America do that want America want to destabilize Russia. Like, I think if the, if you extract, if you don't include that in the conversation, that what you get is a limited we conversation. Don't, we don't want to destabilize Russia. We want to. We were hoping after the Berlin Wall fell, and then two years later, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union fell. We were hoping Russia would uh, become, um, you know, one of the, the nations of the world that joined the family of Western democracies. There was no reason why they couldn't have democracy. They sort of gave it a go, but it was, you know, obviously the past was so corrupted that the future was not going to be. Uh, untainted either. And then we did make mistakes. I would agree with this, which you probably, I, I'm, I'm thinking in the direction you're going in. I don't think we should have uh, kept rolling NATO. Well, first of all, why NATO if there's no Soviet Union? Yeah. Like, I'm not saying we should have necessarily disbanded NATO, but instead of getting more, oh, strong NATO, more countries, it should have been like, okay, we we're saying that the Cold War is over. So why do we need an organization that's against you? Yeah. That was a terrible message to send. Yeah. And I think that set things off. It, it may have gone to shit anyway. I mean, Russia is a tough place. And the people, you know, have been brutalized by communism, which is horrible for the soul, not to mention the pocketbook. But... Um, yeah, go ahead. Bill, can I give you a bunch of facts because, oh, uh, like, boy. like you, then you can riff on them because I'd love to see your yeah. take on these facts well, that come from our content on our show, like the you know our research g gleaned from some yeah. great uh, journalists, and it's mostly okay to say this kind of meta journalism. Right. We accumulate facts. We don't use anything that's not been endorsed in mainstream media. Let me get, hit you up with some of this stuff, and because I genuinely want to hear your take. But let me give you the whole thing as an overview, and then you can as. Bill Maher, because not, let's not, face it, no one else can do this. <laughs> Knock yourself Give, out. <laughs> okay, so former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said recently a Russia-Ukraine peace deal was blocked by Western powers. We know that Boris Johnson visited Ukraine and counseled Zelensky against taking the peace deal that's on the table. That's just one thing. Let me hit you with all this stuff. Zelensky has vowed to retake Crimea, but Russia said that's the red line that will spark nuclear war. We know that, all right? Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell said in December 2022, the most basic reasons for continuing to help Ukraine degrade and defeat the Russian invaders are cold, hard, practical American interests. And then and I'll just widen this out a little. The Pentagon spent $14 trillion after 9-11. 55% of it went to for-profit defense contractors. The average American taxpayer contributed $2,000 to the military last year. More than 900 of that went to corporate military contractors. At least 15 politicians who shape U.S. defense policy have investments in military contractors. Military contractors split their checks more or less evenly between Democrat and Republican candidates last year. And Biden appointed a Black Rock, a former Black Rock MD to the cabinet okay. in particular to sort out okay. this, the post-Ukrainian reconstruction. Okay, I, uh, stop. These, I, are good, I, these are good facts, Bill. These are facts, P possibly. I don't, have, I'm, I don't have a fact checker here. I don't doubt it. You're not going to need one. Wait, wait. 
I, I, but that's, it's so far from the point. I, I mean, I feel no. like your antenna for conspiracy theories, oh. I mean, you have a good antenna and then sometimes uh, it does not serve you well because like, even if all this stuff is true, yeah. it's just more complicated than that. It, both things can be true. It can be something that is a worthy endeavor to stop Russia from invading a, another country. Uh, and, and it also could be the case. It is the case, of course. People in the defense industry are looking to, to keep having reasons to make weapons and so forth. Yes. There are people who absolutely have a vested interest yes. in war. Those are what your facts are saying. It doesn't mean, even if all that is true, and I would agree, there are people who have a vested interest in war. That doesn't mean, logically, it doesn't mean that every war is because of that. I would Wars offer this. Wars can also be for another reason, and then these people glom Absolutely. onto but, that. But, like, That's called like, the shock doctrine. When you take advantage, yes. when you take advantage yes. of a crisis, yes. it's going on. But it also could be the case that the war is a valiant endeavor. I, 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 I'm to not, a point. I'm not excluding I, not that. Not until they bomb Ukraine to nothing. I mean, yeah. there, it's a very valid question uh, now to ask. Um, what I'm saying is, do you think it's a coincidence that the mainstream media only reports on one aspect of, of this conflict? It only gives you one narrative. I'm not like I am obviously not in a. Look at my glittery trousers. I'm not in an opinion <laughs> <laughs> a position to offer a definitive opinion on this. But what I will say is that sometimes when you talk about my antenna, right? This is what I think is like either this war in Ukraine is motivated by a genuine and legitimate need to okay. rightly and correctly support Ukrainian people who are under attack and suffering because of a war. Because I've, when I've been looking at life, I know it's how often humanitarianism is the motivation of the military industrial complex. So they're always like, who can we help now? Who can we help now? And wouldn't it be great if we had a system that's like, oh, just to make sure that there is no other, uh, no other motivation, there can be no profit extracted yeah. from this Conflict, you know that the, the, the aid <laughs> offered will not end up in Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Bay, BAE systems. Okay. Wouldn't that All be right. a beautiful system? Okay. Like, so as long as that right. is one of the possible I, reasons, yes, I th I isn't it the most likely I I reason? I well, again, I've, now I feel I'm like... Not saying, I'm talking about complexity. I feel like now we're just making... We, like you've uh, made your point and right. I've made mine and now I feel like we're repeating ourselves because like, I'm just going to say again, and I, I, it sounds like you didn't hear me. Like both things can be true. It doesn't. No, but you said earlier, not everything like, has Putin to be Putin is a monster, or. and Zelensky is a hero. And I'm like, well, hang on. What about this shit? Because do you think like how uh, how and, long and do you think for, Zelensky is going to get support if you, his interests don't to converge be, with the MIC? Throwing your hands together, like oh, on the one hand, yeah, Putin is a, <laughs> a murderer who pushes people out of windows and starts wars and and all these crimes against humanity. And this guy has some shady business dealings. He's Ukrainian. He was born with a shady business dealing. I mean, that's what the country was known for before this. But okay, let's not. Uh, we'll what, we'll I, park I, it. I what? We we'll park that. Park, park that. it. Well, yeah, we we made You're our point. We're actually going to do shots. So, Oh, wait, well, no, no, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pour this. I'm not, I'm, I just want to know: Does that look like more than a shot? I would say that's a generous shot. That's, but it's a shot glass. So why are they? Yeah, what else can it be? Are they trying to get me drunk? I'm just gonna have a little. But I, I, I suddenly realized. I was trying to think. It was in my mind. Why? What is his accent? That I, it amuses me so much. I just your accent is exactly the accent that Eric Idle uses in Monty Python when he's playing the dumb guy. Boy! <laughs> Which one? Like a Reg, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like in what the, did the Romans have it do? Like, uh, well, or, I mean, I love you, you really, even though there's an insult in that. No, there, what there, I'll <laughs> say that I'm, it's more no, like... No, it's, it's, it's a compliment in, because, because the, it's it. the contrast of how bright you are with, <laughs> with that character who is not. I know. But this you is, sound alike. It's because I'm from Essex, which is the New Jersey of my country. This is the 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 dirty but little you know secret what I'm I've tracked across the Atlantic that with. That voice that he does. Uh, yeah, of course I do. But what I would say, I would offer you as a, a Monty Python aficionado and devotee, must is be. it's more like Holy Grail, where it's like, oh, come and witness the oppression of the system with Michael <laughs> Palin. Like, oh, look at how they're oppressing me. Who made you king? I didn't vote for you. We're an anarcho-syndicalist. That's uh, that's I mean, so close to that it. movie. 
Yeah, the Grail. I could watch it every year like The Wizard of Oz. It's yeah. just, it's just, first of all, it's so funny. Yeah. Like just funny, funny. Yeah. And then the points they were making, mm. they're, they're so prescient. There's, there's, a, there's one where he, remember he's, he wants to be a woman? I yeah. want to be known as Loretta, Reg. <laughs> What's the point in fighting for your right to have babies when he can't have babies? Where's right. the fetus going to gestate? You're going to keep it in a box? I mean, that's like something someone could have written for a sketch last year because of all that kind of stuff that's going on. This is, I suppose, why my true ideology, my true religion is comedy. Because this, the, the ability to continually refer to isn't this bloody ridiculous. None of us know anything. We're right. all putting on a show, for God's sake. Exactly. Try some, it's a mess. My life's a mess. I don't know how to cope with my own life. I don't know how you're going to solve the conflict in right. Ukraine. I right. don't know what you're going to do about the right. influence of corporations on American government. I don't know. The truth well, is, I don't know. And it's bloody ridiculous. And, you know, like, having recourse to and I think this is why we are seeing do you agree the emergence of uh, comedic commentary in the political space I suppose maybe it began with you John Stewart that kind of stuff and then, oh, you know, yeah, maybe even yeah. before you like oh, yes. Carlin well, Kicks and what's different yes I mean there was always some of that what's different is that what I w was doing when we started was something that they said could never work which is having the host also render an opinion. The other guys yeah. like Johnny Carson yeah. never did that. It was yeah. like, no, you'll alienate half the audience. And my theory was, no, they, they can like you if they, dis if they don't agree with you. In the 30 years since I started, that's almost completely switched. Yeah. Because now to survive like in a late night American talk show, you have to just be preaching to that liberal audience, which is, you know, mostly what I would agree with too, but it's like, it's so indoctrinated and it's so like, all we all have agreed that this is the premise. Like Maloney's a fascist. That's a perfect example. We all read it in the New York Times, and now that's what we're, or somebody read it for us yeah. <laughs> and told us. And now we, the, the Italians are taken over by the fascists. And like no attempt to like look under the surface or far, a, a differing point of view or just and. So just stuff that will make people clap in the audience because this is what my team believes. This is, you know, ivermectin is horse medicine or whatever it is. You yes. know, I think uh, you brought that up today. And uh, like that was a really good example. I mean, they absolutely did like just it's ivermectin. It's a drug. It's not a politician. How you can like the way they in this country like can just this just knee jerkingly take a very obstinate side of an issue that's just that what are you talking about either it works or it doesn't doctors prescribe it to humans it's not it's maybe it helps and maybe it doesn't maybe like some drugs it helps some people and not others what it's in, that to me is just the most insane thing that this becomes like you you are a witch because you believe in it or you are you know a genius i, I it's it's not that the Dramatic. book that I found most helpful on this subject has, was written by a former CIA analyst called Martin Guri. He wrote a book called The Revolt of the Public. He had a apolitical role within the CIA. That's how he describes it as a data analyst. Uh, he oh. says that in, 2000, in 2001, this is presumably a fact, as much information was public, uh, published that year as in all human history up to that point. And in 2002, because of really? the ad advent of the internet, oh, two, yeah, of course. and then in 2002, the amount of information doubled again. And then every year since, the amount of information published has doubled. He said that when you looked at it on a, a, on a graph, it looked like a tidal wave and it had the kind of impact that a mm. tidal wave will have. Information is being generated and created. You can't generate a central narrative and not have it challenged in the same way that you could 50 years ago. Now, mm. a, a single journalist or individual with a phone can create content that can be seen by millions and millions of people. As soon as a narrative emerges, there's a counter narrative, there's a <laughs> counterpoint, you know, like our discussion there about Ukraine. Again, I'm not like, you know, these are not nailed on facts for me. These are discussion points that ought to be included in the mix when you're talking about something as, as potentially uh, in century as nuclear Armageddon. You want to make sure that you've considered all, all of right. the facts and that you have a media that isn't so beholden to centralized interests. Right. That it's not including all of the facts. 
He said, Martin Gurry, that what he, you know, he says, uh, that he goes, I believe in liberal democracy. That's what I believe in. This guy is not a radical. But what he's saying is, is that we, we said we saw it first with Napster, then the Arab Spring, then the Occupy movement, that the potential for disruption became so, uh, as, became so, so sort of ravenous and potent that they had a choice to make. Either we're going to have to alter the way that power operates, except that there are numerous publics, numer numerous veers, numerous perspectives that people hold very dearly, or we're going to have to double down on authoritarianism. How is it that the Democrat Party, the shrine of liberalism, social liberalism, open-mindedness, investigation, became the party of authoritarianism? Well, the argument, and of course, Bernie Sanders made all the well, economic arguments, but he says more broadly and, well, uh, and, and beyond these the distinctions between the two parties, is you now have to double down. And it ta even taking in your late night talk show thing is like, that's over now. They've got their audience. The but, Republican right have got their audience. The Democrat left have got their audience. Play to your audience. Count the money. The model's again, changed. For, for proper perspective, I hope you would concede that the greatest threat that come out of America as far as falling into authoritarianism came from Trump claiming that he did not lose an election he plainly lost and getting a giant chunk of his party to go along with that. That is the threat to authoritarianism. Other threats do exist, including some from the left. They are not nearly on that level. I I'd may like say, don't you think it's a greater threat that whoever wins an election, the changes, as we discussed on your show, are not going to be significant enough for most people? That that's the real threat. The, the real threat is, you know, the reason that the, most of the lobbying Look, money is split 50-50 is because they're perfectly fine with either party getting in. I, I've been hearing this for, for, I don't know, since I was a teenager. Right. Like, what, no, and I haven't told you yet. <laughs> I've been hearing, let me tell you first. <laughs> don't, don't jump your cue. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been hearing since I was a kid that, well, why don't people get in the streets? Things are so horrible, and it's like, I finally realized, because for like probably a majority, but certainly a great preponderance of people in America, life just isn't this unremitting nightmare. And so, yes, do, as a liberal, do I believe for the people who life is a nightmare, we should constantly be working harder to make it so it's not for them? Yes, I do. Am I willing to give a big chunk of my money? And I do, to alleviate that misery, that we're all kind of in this together and it's not, not just not cool if some people are really suffering. Yes, I do. But the reason why Bernie's, Bernie's don't get elected and there isn't people in the streets all the time is because most people is like, on a very basic level, they get it that uh, maybe America is actually still better than most places we could be. And I'm not really doing that bad. No one's actually starving. We have lots of problems and there are homeless on the streets and lots of shit. But, you know, I get up every day. I fucking do what I want. I have material goods. The toilets work. Yes, it's a mess in a lot of ways. But, you know, Am I going in the streets? No, I've got a meeting tomorrow for, for something, for my business, because this is still a country where I can start a business and, and like I can reinvent myself. That's a lot of what people like about America. That, is that face you're giving me because of the smoke or you because of what I'm saying? <laughs> I guess it's what I'm saying. It's, because, it's, it's such a bad face you have. <laughs> it, was like, it, was like a, it was like a, I smell a fart face. It was just awful. And especially since I'm so right. No, it's because, uh, <laughs> like, I think it's because of despondency and despair and a kind of uh, yes. castration of the spirit. That's what I think is, is that people, by and large, don't believe. I, I, and I, I think that the phenomena of Trump could be regarded differently. I'm not talking about the sort of the contested elections because my personal perspective is <laughs> it doesn't actually matter who gets in for a significant number of people. And I'm sure you're right when you're talking about like the professional class or coastal folk or most people that enjoy <laughs> the affluence that I've been afforded over my well, lucky little life. But I, I also believe that hmm, I read a good book by a man called Mark Fisher, God rest his soul, though he was an atheist and won't thank me for saying that. He wrote a book called Capitalist Realism. He said that what had, he, he believes that the great triumph of capitalism has been that we can no longer envisage a system beyond it. He said famously, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. People aren't even willing to imagine that there's a possible there's the possibility because of divorcing corporate and state interests. Because capitalism works. 
I'm not talking for about a great deal of people. That's why it's popular. It's working same, less this, and less, though. The same way, like stereo became popular. Like we oh, could have stuck so with mono, but we were like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually better. It kind of works. It, does it lose something? I guess that's why they keep putting albums back out in mono. And I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you just put them back on on 78s for fuck's sake? Why are we going backwards? <laughs> or the kids, they like vinyl. Like you know, I have my old vinyl. It's like, pl please. Uh, enjoy listening to shitty sounding records that are scratchy. I would say in a way, people are on the streets. People have been on the streets, not in enormous numbers, protesting like for uh, an end to current conflicts. The Black Lives Matter protests and obviously the movements uh, around That's Donald the... Trump and the movements around masks and the trucker protests and all of the agricultural protests well, in Germany and Sri Lanka and Holland, all around the world, people are protesting. Do you know and a I've... lot of people who have been in, at protests or in the streets because I don't know anybody. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's just like it, it just like people were sympathetic. Maybe it's because I'm older and my people my age don't get, go out and do, and do anything. Let <laughs> alone go to the fucking street. I don't go to a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Even that too no, much when, bother. When, it's it's ama amazing how ageist this country is. But, but what, what I mean to say is that there there are s significant protest movements. But I think what there is is a, a clear lack of a real vision that. Probably since Clinton and Blair onwards, no one is suggesting anything other than the management of decline, the kind of intimate bu bureaucracies where we biometrically me measure and manage our own health. No one's saying we could do something fantastic with America. Rhetorically, of course, great claims are made by either side, but no one's suggesting that we could reorganize society. No one's anticipating what the AI revolution is about to behold, the loss of jobs, the despair, the despondency, and that 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 is likely to engender. And we were sort of seeing a return to feudalism. Yeah, in that beautiful film, uh, The House I Live In, uh, the great writer of that show, The Wire, said, um, you know, when it comes to the opioid crisis and the addiction crisis in your country, he said, well, why don't we just admit that in a post-manufacturing America, we've got no need for 20% of the population. They're redundant now. They're defunct. We can lose them. And sometimes I think it comes down to simple demographics that this nation can carry a good many deeply dissatisfied and unhappy people. And by God, it looks like it is. Because if this ain't nothing, all of this conflagration that's going on in this country, mostly uh, it's seemingly housed around the but, culture war, where I think they're quite happy for people to quibble and quarrel and roar, but, because ultimately that doesn't affect the interests of the kind of uh, the, the elite establishment interests that I'm interested in addressing and that Bernie has tried to address. And I would offer you this, because it seems as a result, uh, uh, during the conversations that I have had with some like former Democrat Party uh, presidential candidates, that that party almost consciously, deliberately but, and explicitly decided they would rather have have Trump win than win themselves with Bernie. And I'd like to put that to you because that, for me, if that okay, is true, Okay, I, I will answer a... that, but I, I will answer it in, first in this way. C could, can I just take this conversation, same topic, but a little more toward the pedestrian diurnal. I mean, I know you intellectuals, you know, what do you mean, you intellectuals? I just told you I'm from the New Jersey of I England. I know, but you, I may but be you, sipping but you, do think, you do think like an intellectual. I mean, it's, it, it's uh, because that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, Let's go, let's go to daily life and see if daily life matches with your theory of life. Because like, as you go through your day, now maybe I live in a charmed world. Of course you do. Of course I do. I don't think I live you in do. such a charmed world where I go to an office, you know, I see people who work, they're not all like uh, making giant salaries. <laughs> One person at that show is, I'm not gonna say who. <laughs> <laughs> but this play, HBO is very generous. It's a good job, but it's just a job. We all do it. I have to say, I'm the same as them. Like, oh, there are days like, oh God, I don't wanna, I'm, I'm tired, but I gotta keep working. And we work, we all do our best. And, and I don't think they're unhappy. And then if I go out and get coffee somewhere and, uh, you know, even or a waiter or like even the guy who's like the valet guy, they're, they're, they don't seem miserable. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to pray. They like, you know, they're living their life. Like when I was in my 20s, I was poor. It was I got it. Like, you know, I'm working my way up and uh, there is opportunity and there's stumbles along the way. And uh, there's lots of problems and we should keep working on them. But it's like. I don't know if it's going to get better by being massively uh, rewriting human nature, which is impossible, or the way the world is constructed. I think people are selfish. I think you have to always factor that in. Anytime you're developing any kind of economic system, people are selfish.
and they will go toward what makes their life better. Hopefully not at the cost of somebody too much, but sometimes, you know. You believe in enlightened self-interest. But also I don't figure you for a misanthrope. I don't don't feel that at the heart of your beliefs is people are bad. Because at the the core of my ideology is a, a... a, 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 not even a begrudging, but an optimistic love of humanity. And uh, my belief, Bill, is that if we enshrine, elevate, celebrate, and possibly even legislate the higher principles <laughs> about nature, compassion, uh, kindness, service, yes. unity, a willingness to sacrifice. And this is where it does get personal because I have to ask myself, what are you willing to give up, Russell Brand, in order to live in a fairer world? And that's, I'm not just talking about taxation because, by the way, affluent, like sort of mean a million you know, entertainers but, ain't the issue. We're talking about billionaire I, I feel offshore like, corporations I, with unprecedented power that make the Carnegies and the Rockefellers look like sort of quaint little guys with Jackson dimes. You know, but I feel, I, my guess is that you live a very nice life and my opinion of that is you should. You're talented, you worked your way up, and but you can't like enjoy it without having some, I think, inappropriate guilt or like, it shouldn't be this way. It's, the world is only what it is. We're always trying to better it, but there's, you know, just enjoy. And no, you shouldn't trade places with someone who's like not doing well. We should lift that person up. That doesn't mean we have to like uh, put ourselves down, lift, lift up the people who need lifting. I agree with this entirely. Oh, good. I, we're, I'm in absolute <laughs> agreement with that. I'd prefer Even to... the part where you're making yourself crazy for no reason? Maybe. About, really? I'm open to that. Uh, I'm open to that. I'm open to the fact that something well, can you... Can I absolve you of that? Oh, can I put... God, please. Please, there's no it's reason okay. why... Am I doing you... all right? Absolutely. And your life hasn't been a picnic either. You've had some really trying times and all that addiction and, you know, bad press. <laughs> <laughs> the addiction and the bad press wasn't easy. I mean, um, just, you know... But, uh, you know, you, how old are you now? 47. 47. You're like, right, you're perfectly where you should be. I mean, and by the way, there's nothing you couldn't do in show business. I don't know. Oh God, what, you, you, you must just not want, you must not want to, but you like doing what you're doing. I mean, you're, more, you're a crusader. You don't have yes. time to like get in spandex and do a, <laughs> but you would be such an awesome you know, you're perfect for like the Marvel universe. I mean, you could be the villain, you could be the erudite man, you could be like something. I have a calling and yeah. I'm, uh, you know, like we discussed and joked about, remember, it's, it seems like an eternity ago when I was r- r- rifling through my rucksack in search of the mini moil that, that, <laughs> that you mentioned that, <laughs> that, I, that I am a seeker. And what, uh, when you uh. say something like we should lift people up, that I feel that there is no chance of that happening with the kind of entrenched systemic interests right. that we have now, because yeah. it, as they say yeah. in the circles I move in, it's not a bug it's a feature there is a requirement for endemic pro- yeah, poverty there no. is a requirement for a, a, an abandoned and suffering class of people there is a requirement to distract us with conversations that well, whilst I, important I, will not I, alter the trajectory of I, ordinary people's lives and do you know what i agree with I, I all can't that help it I, I, <laughs> I wish i could like i mean i don't mean i can't help the situation I, i'm sure i can make some small contribution what i mean to say is that this appears to be the most organic expression of the drive that i've always felt i mean you know you became like a you're ultimately with two stand-up comedians that have had breaks in various ways and for me the stand-up comedy it seemed like oh my god this is the purest form i can just get up there and i can say whatever i want and like you i'm sure i did it for nothing in clubs for a long long time open mic spots i'm paid gigs i did it i did it i got bottled on stage i got dragged off stage. i had I, tough tough times and i'm so glad isn't it great the, that it's over the t- so great <laughs> when people when people ask me you know say how do you do it stand up i always Tell them, if you really want to know the truth, you know, you, the, you have this idea that so much pain, sad clowns were said, there is a, to- a shitload of pain, but it's all like in the first few years. Mm-hmm. Then there's things that are not perfect, but it's that beginning where you're learning to be funny in front of people when you're not funny. I mean, yeah. you, you probably were a hit right away because you just have a natural a gift of the gab that, and, and I mean, the fact that you don't like, um, I mean, I would love to see you live, and you don't you don't play in America, do you? Yeah, yeah, I did a show. I, I do. I, I've not been here for a while, but like, I do do I do live gigs. I'm not like a, when I talk to a Rogan, he says like, you know, you you should like it's a duty to do the clubs and stuff. <laughs> 
and, and like, but like Stanhope, <laughs> like, like Stanhope says, you know, like I worked hard <laughs> to get that audience, and now I'm going to play to them. I'm going to play to the people that love me, that come to see me because they want to hear what I've got to say, rather than that that, that agony right. of persuading these fuckers. That's so funny. I mean, I I have the highest regard for Joe Rogan. I really do. Um, I wish I could do his show more. I did it last year. Yeah, no, I watched. But. Um, that is such a Joe Rogan thing to say about, like he has that, he's that kind of comic. I've known that comic since I started. There's a kind of comic who's like, it's almost like we're in the army, <laughs> the army of comics. And they're, and they're just very, uh, you know, they're just very, ch and I get it. I mean, I love comedy too. I, I just don't have that like, you know, um, you know, you gotta, when I started, there was a lot of rules. Uh -huh. Like, um, well, you gotta have six clean, Tonight Show shots before you move to California. You know, we had this like template. Wow. Yeah. And then, yes, yeah, so you get clean. So that's like 30 minutes of very clean material so you can do it on The Tonight Show. And then you'll get a sitcom. Mm. You know, that was the thing. We all wanted to be in a sitcom. Yeah, that was the pathway. That was the route for the, the for the elite achieving comic. I, I like. I sometimes feel guilty again that I don't do that. Like I'm like, yeah, get out there and do them clubs. Suffer a little bit. Go out there and win them over and get. Make sure that your opening five is good and it is dutiful. Like because I <laughs> like I love like you know so, like uh, like I feel like Bill Burr he would play anywhere and he'd make it work and Louis would play anywhere like sure. make it make it work. You know like I a Chappelle like you know I. A, a, Adore uh, those, you know, contemporary American comics at the top rock. All of them guys, um, and, uh, but I suppose where, of, like, for me, and I'd, I'd love to hear more about like your contemporaries and how you came up and stuff. I feel like, um, you know, like, the, like for me, there's a been a there's a, there's shamanism in stand up comedy. There's a real ability to cr create beautiful feeling in that room to explode stuff to explore incredible ideas and i sort of when i i've had like you know the reason i did movies and all that stuff is because it's just hard not to if people offer you those things you feel like oh my god i've got to do it but yeah. for me it's a, it's a world away from what i actually want to do you're very lucky to have uh, lucky and of course uh, diligent and fastidious to have carved out for yourself this position where you can operate in what seems to me to be the your uh, perfect environment you know like that's amazing and it doesn't happen for very many comics and of course there are reasons yeah, they I've been lucky. Here. I'm not dis and lucky I mean, and I've been, I mean HBO has been a great place I mean we survived for a while on ABC for six years even but like HBO really gets me and I do well for them you know so it's like that rare marriage where and they're genuinely nice people you know they're like people you could deal with they're not they're not See. yeah I mean they they caught it they sort of for a long time had it to themselves this mode of operation which was to hire people to do shows and then completely leave them alone and be like we trust you just mm. do your thing and we don't interfere a lot and for a long time they had that to themselves other networks were too stupid to do that they wanted a, their network executives to always make notes and just too much meddling and finally the other ones got the hint that the real talent is always going to migrate to the place where there can be they can be free Mm. And and HBO has had some uh, bombs because they let the, somebody they trusted. We don't all hit a, a thousand, you know. We don't all get it, and that's okay. That's what art is. It's sometimes it's failing, and when it's failing, it's thank God only failing for thirteen weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had my shot at that. I had I did a show on FX where they gave me probably a little too much freedom, you know, like and I I, I misused it and misspent it. <laughs> like a little too well, avant garde. But good. that's their loss. Really. And so where you should be on American TV every night. Well, with the show I have now, I did this deal with Rumble. Yeah, I did you don't five need shows. TV. Exactly. You it's amazing. TV. TV's like TVs, like kids don't even have TVs. No, it's, yeah, it's an old medium. Moving towards obsolescence, presumably, other than in some like particular, uh, some manageable spaces, I would would assume. And the, the, what I have now, doing a show five days a week, streaming live, uncensored, tackling the right. idea of appealing to an audience that so what, I know are ultimately more open to sort of right wing politics, but doing my best to. Uh, convey ideas beyond that that ultimately so I this what is rumble now i'm so rumble's I'm like some a, media um stupid it's a uh, it's a, essentially a competitor to youtube which has made its raison d'etre 
non-censorship that has been taken up initially by a lot of right, uh, like you'd have to say, right-wing uh, voices, uh, but is doesn't have any skin in the game with regard to like well, the kind of content that is put out, except for that you continue to own your content and you know you can say what you want. You can talk about what you want. And like for me, like freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of speech to right. sort of condemn and criticize people. It means freedom of speech no, to I'm, attack establishment and look for ways to bring people together. I'm interested in, I suppose, a re-emergent populism. And I feel that this, like a left-wing populism as it was initially intended to be, it was assumed there will be an accompaniment to the trade union movement a true populare, the empowerment of people, as much democracy as possible, as much control over community right. as possible, a real ability to confront establishment power and even state power. The, the, two, the, the, the two heads of the Hydra being a, an over-empowered state and an over-empowered corporate world. And now that we have those things essentially combined, this in absolute symbiosis. You know, there is so an, is this is this Dave, the Dave Rubin? Dave Rubin's on there. Yeah, I know Dave's been on. It's not his company, though, right? But it they've has... owned, I believe, Locals, which is the sort of membership okay. aspect of Rumble, which yeah, is essentially been, like YouTube. He's been here. I love, love, I love him. Yeah, he's a great guy. And, yeah, and we don't agree politically. No, but, I, but we laugh about it. It's, 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 yeah. And the here's the problem with where we are, media-wise, as it, especially free speech. You know, as comics, we adore free speech. I, it's, it's my lifeblood. I couldn't be. Yeah. I'm so grateful to the people who came before me who were martyrs for free speech in a way. I mean, Lenny Bruce had nine trials, I think. You know, trials, actual trials. Yeah. <laughs> Not like, oh, my trials. No, I mean, like, we're actually putting you on trial. Yeah. But so free speech, I mean, when I was younger, I mean, there was no doubt in my mind who the champions of free speech were and, and also the threat. And the threat was all on the right yeah. and the champions were all on the left. And that's not how I feel now. So when people say like, oh, why are you harder on the left? Well, that's one of the big reasons because I certainly appreciate the threat of uh, free speech from the right. I mean, Trump said, if anyone took him seriously, like if he was a normal president where you didn't just hear something crazy again today and then write it off, people would have been very alarmed because he would say things like, you know, the media is the enemy of the people. I mean, this is like Hitler talk, you know, and uh, maybe we should look into the New York Times or MSN. Maybe they should lose their light. You know, just stuff that's really threatening. So I get it. There is threat on the right. But the left is much more in my face, much more constant, much more a daily problem. Just you just they just want to catch you and find people that go cancel there's just a, a mean girl attitude to it, and it just squatches and puts fear in people. So people don't speak their mind. When, when people are making cringy apologies, I always want to say, you know what? Maybe the woke people should apologize to me and people like me for all the things they robbed us of never hearing. Jokes that were never told because someone was just too scared to say something. You know, letters, emails, things that were never written thoughts that were never expressed because it was just easier to go along. So when I hear about a free speech platform, yeah. unfortunately, now that to a lot of people and including me, my antenna goes up like, is this actually a right wing platform? Because, because the right, it's funny, because the right actually, I think, wants this kind of free speech. That's what, like, like, I know a lot of doctors who uh, were reasonable people who should have been heard on yeah. COVID. Yeah. But MSNBC wouldn't put them on. Oh, no. we should have brought that up today. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I, I was moving into, I was going to do So yeah, the only I place they list. could go was Fox News. So then they get branded a conservative because they're on Fox News and they're saying, I'm not. They're just the only ones who would put me on. There were v people that invented vaccines that were being called anti-vaxxers. Right. The whole right. thing became it became hysterical. But I mean, that's the problem with, so like when I hear about this, organ I'm like, is it really a bunch of just right-wingers or is it really free speech? So tell me. Well, I believe that those categories are starting to- Because you're certainly not just a right-winger. No, I'm not. I mean, like, this is how I approach this. Like, people should be able to believe politically what they want to believe. It, it, it seems to me that if you're on the libertarian right, that you would believe in people's right for freedom of expression right on the, what is currently regarded as the far left. Whether, you know, if you want to be left right. alone, you should be left alone to be who you want to be. And in fact, 
fact, some kind of truce around traditionalism and progressivism seems to be the, the, a necessary one at this point. Look, you be as progressive as you want to be. You be as traditional as you want to be. Right. Let's leave each other alone. We're going to kill each other over this right. stuff. We've got bigger <laughs> fish to fry. Right. A, you know, and so the way that Rumble is regarded, and I spoke to Rogan about this, is you know it's being portrayed as a right-wing space. And there's no doubt that, that there have been right-wing contributors that have, co con that have accelerated its ascent as a platform. But the reason I'm there, I've got no interest in condemning people or criticizing people because of their lifestyle right. choices, because of their culture. I believe, I do believe in freedom. I do believe in freedom. Right. But I feel that you cannot have that freedom without an open dialogue and an open discourse around all of these subjects and the ability to make mistakes and the ability to be wrong and to resolve these issues collegiately and collectively with in good faith, not be looking for ways to find easy sort of to, to tag it back to Trump or to tag it to this and to me you know, like to, there has to be a, sort of some good faith arguments Bill I need a pee quite bad um, and, I know. and I'm I, like I got, younger I got, than no, you I'm, I'm, I gotta we have to wrap this up I could talk to you all night is, that, is, is this the wrap up shuffle yeah, there yeah yeah but um oh, <laughs> I sh I, oh, I'm shall I shuffle for no, no, no. wait I just can I just are oh, you shuffling forward to say something <laughs> shuffle back I was going to <laughs> what what were you just talking about? Yeah, uh, you were like quite high because my whole life smoked a cigar. I'm completely what, in the I same know. mood I was but when I was on HBO. Just, <laughs> what were you just saying? It was something. I was saying that we need to. We got bigger fish to fry than, yeah. and we have to have a truce between yeah, traditionalism and progressivism. You get the idea. It's yeah, the same yeah. stuff I'm always saying. Forget. Are um, you going to let me do a pee? Because I'm actually in some yeah, distress. But, it doesn't yeah. take me long. Right. No. Let's just. This was like... Uh, We're going to wrap it up on the page. I, I think so, because like I worked all day, you yeah. worked all day. I don't want to... I feel like I'm taking advantage of you. <laughs> but oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, you know, I admire you for, for so much because you're so passionate about these things. But I just... Because I just mentioned Lenny Bruce. So I'm going to say that that's a sign from the universe. And by the way, Dave Rubin's always trying to convince me about the universe, which I find amusing. But... Um, I'm going to pr pretend there's such a thing as the universe <laughs> <Just read messages. laughs> and say that uh, Lenny Bruce, you know, he forgot to like be an entertainer because yeah. he was so passionate. Right. I don't want that to happen to you. I don't okay. think it will. It never has. You proved that like not just here, but on real time today it was just like, you know, you bring it, man. And just, uh, that's, you know, I don't know why I'm <laughs> anointing myself as the person to give you advice you probably Thank you. don't need. No, but, I'd, 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 but I want please, it. Please, you're just such a great entertainer. Please don't, like, just, you know, I know the uh, the world is falling apart and it's certainly mostly your fault. <laughs> 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 but you know that old saying, don't pity the martyr, he likes his job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We had a laugh, didn't we? Well, I'm Can I do it because I am quite desperate. Yes, I don't want to I'm rush so ahead because I bet I'm you need so to pee sorry. as well. No, I'm so sorry. Oh, God. Oh,